We're coming to 1 Thessalonians chapter uh, 2, verse 17, to chapter 3, verse 5 today as we continue in our studies in 1 Thessalonians. And so uh, I would ask you to stand uh, in honor of God and His Word who speaks with clarity and with authority as I read this section of God's Word to us. And may God's Word, uh, as we looked at last week in verse 13, uh, may, we, may we experience today God's Word at work in us who believe. So hear the Word of the Lord. The Apostle Paul writes, But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face. Because we wanted to see you. We wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus Christ? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to exhort you in your faith that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass and just as you know. And for this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. This is God's word. Let's bow together. Thank you, Father, that you have given us your word, that your word instructs us, that your word comforts us, that your word equips us and shapes us. It fills in gaps in our lives that need filling. It uh, gives us insight into the world that you've made and to the resources that you've given us in Christ Jesus. Today, I pray that you would draw us closer to you and closer to one another as we ponder the way in which the apostolic circle cared for and ministered to the church in Thessalonica and the way in which there was a, a mutuality in that and a longing to be face to face. And Lord, we, we experience that even now, the desire to be face to face, unveiled together with you and with one another. And we thank you that you've brought so many of us together today to be here. And may we rejoice in your good work for your glory in our midst. And so as your word is heard and applied, may you be greatly glorified in all of our lives as a body together for Jesus' sake. Amen. Please be seated. You may recall that in our uh, studies in 1 Thessalonians, one of the uh, themes that is coming out again and again is this idea of different, uh, taking a, a cue from the Apple ad campaign of many years ago uh, to th think different. Uh, we want to recognize that because of the gospel, not only do we have the opportunity to think different, we really are different. And so we can think different, love different, serve different, all kinds of differences can be evidenced in our lives. And we want to be able to, to see that. And we see that in this text today as the relationship that the Apostle Paul and Silas and Timothy sustained with the church in Thessalonica was out of the ordinary. It was something different, something that the Apostle Paul writes about in his letter to them. And what we see here is that the gospel of Jesus Christ had made an entry into their lives. We saw that in Acts chapter 17, that there, there were many who heard the gospel and believed. And so the gospel made an entry. But what Paul is describing in this letter is his joy in realizing that not only did the gospel make an entry, but the gospel has made a difference. 
The gospel is not simply a, a transaction, my sin for Jesus' righteousness, though it's a wonderful transaction. The gospel is a transformation where bit by bit, day by day, piece by piece, I'm being shaped and molded and so are you to be just like Jesus Christ. One day he will appear and we will be like him is what the word of God declares. And that's true. And so Paul, in this situation, is experiencing some concern for the church in Thessalonica because now he is at a distance from them. He's no longer able to see what's going on. He's concerned about what's happened in their lives. As he expresses in chapter 3 and verse 5, he has a legitimate fear that the tempter may have tempted them and then their labor would have been in vain for nothing that they would have served and worked and given of themselves there, and there's nothing to be seen as a result of that. And Paul's concerned about that. You remember last week in chapter 2, we looked at how Paul declared the entry point of the gospel in their lives, that he brought the gospel, and it was a, a pure gospel message. No error, no deceit, no impurity. Paul brought that to them and that entry point was good. And yet Paul backed that up, as he says in chapter 1 and in chapter 2, with the way that they lived their lives. He didn't want to be a burden to them. On the contrary, he says, we were gentle among you, like a, a nursing mother caring for her own children. And we were like a father, encouraging and exhorting and charging you to walk worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. He says, that's how we cared for you. You remember that. You remember how we cared. And now he says in verse 17, but since we were torn away, ah, torn away. Do you, do you see pictures there of a father or a mother now having to, because of the pressure of the situation, move to a different place. Paul has left Thessalonica. He has gone to Berea. And from Berea, he has gone down to Athens. So we're torn away. In fact, the, the, the Greek word that's used here is a compound of uh, apa, which means a preposition, away from. And then there's another word, and I bet you know what English word we get from this one. Are you ready? Orphanos. Does that sound like orphan to you? It sounds like orphan to me. There's a connection there. We were bereaved. We were ripped away. And so we were no longer in that situation, physical circumstance, where we could show tender mother care, strong father care to you. And so we were away from you. And he says, we were away from you. And the ESV says, in person, not in heart. Interesting how translation works. I bet you can't guess what word Paul uses there for that idea, figuratively speaking, of being in person. It's face. We were torn apart from you in face, but not in heart. And isn't that what we've been experiencing in some ways over these months? I mean, it's so good to see David and Kat today, face to face. Oh, wow, they're still alive. And Donnie's up there. You people are, you're, you've carried on. God has sustained us during this time. And so for some it's been a few months, for some it's been several months, for some a few weeks. But we rejoice in being able to be together with one another face to face. He says, we endeavored, we strove, we tried really hard. It's the same word that Paul uses in Ephesians 4, where he says, we ought to be diligent to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We worked hard at this. We wanted to see you eagerly with great desire. And notice, he says, we didn't want to see a picture of you, a mosaic representation, a watercolor rendering pixelated images? No, he says, we wanted to see you face to face. There is a certain dimension and power and wonder of being face to face. Physical presence makes a difference, and Paul longs for that. He says, we wanted to come to you. And then, he, did you notice that shift in verse 18? He's been talking about we, 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 we. 
first person plural pronouns. And now Paul shifts and says, I. I wanted to talk to you. I wanted to come to you. I wanted to be with you again and again. The intensity of Paul's personal connection to the people in Thessalonica. He doesn't just say as the editorial, the royal we, the apostolic we. He says, I wanted to see you. But Satan hindered us. It's pretty easy for us sometimes in a modern culture to blame Satan for all kinds of things. Anything that we don't want to take responsibility for, uh, the devil did it. The devil made me do it, was the phrase years ago. Uh, no, we need to take responsibility for what's ours, but recognize the reality, as Paul does, the reality of satanic opposition and oppression. The devil is not your friend. He never wakes up in the morning thinking about you in a good way. His playbook is always what? Steal, kill, destroy. He's not on your side. And don't think that you can kind of flip him a little bit of you know, street smack and make him happy. He's not going to be happy. He's against you. He's your adversary, our adversary, the devil. And so Paul says, I wanted to come to you, but I recognize that Satan kept chopping up the roadway, kept throwing up obstacles and roadblocks to keep us from making a way to you. And that ought to tell us something. Again, it reinforces the reality. Physical presence makes a difference. It's one thing to get a note from someone. It's another thing to talk on the phone with someone. And remember, Paul didn't have a telephone. And it's entirely a, a wonderful blessing to be able to look at a device and see someone thousands of miles away. Just as some of you watching this YouTube today are thousands of miles away. That, that's a wonderful thing, but it's not the same as being physically present, paying attention face to face to another human being. And Paul says, this matters. This matters. And why did the people matter so much? Look at verse 19. What is our hope? What is our joy? What is our crown of boasting? before our Lord Jesus Christ. The relationship with him, the distance is there, the desire is there, and the delight is there that Paul says, I want to be with you because you are our hope. Some of you are saying, time out, okay? I thought Jesus was our hope. Yes, you're right. He says, you are our hope. You are our joy. And again, the time out crowd says, I thought Jesus was our joy. Well, yes, okay? And Paul says, you are our crown of boasting. Isn't Jesus the one who is the crown? Well, yeah, he's the king? Well, I, yes. But notice where he puts all these. You're our hope. You are our joy. You are our crown, which is decorated with boasts of what God has done in you. But then the next preposition ties it up before our Lord Jesus Christ. And believe it or not, that little preposition, actually it's a big preposition, contains the word that reminds us again of face. It means before the presence of. It's the same word that he used in chapter 1 and verse 3. We remember all these things constantly before our God and Father, in the presence of, before the face of our God and Father. See, their hope, Paul's hope, is in Jesus, but he has the hope that the good news of what the gospel has done in the Thessalonians, that's his hope before the Lord Jesus Christ. That's his joy before the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's his crown of boasting before the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, you are our glory and joy. Now, let's take time to reflect on that for a moment. It's my experience that we don't talk like this to each other. Am I right? <laughs> yeah, we, we, don't, we don't talk like this to each other. Even men and women in marriages don't talk like this to each other. 
there's a, there's a lesson to be learned here. We have a model here to imitate. I ran across something this week that illustrates this, and I hope you'll bear with me. I have, Robert, show a picture there. Um, the lover of cats. That's, that's my cat. That's my cat Fidget when he was a little kitty, and he was in the Christmas tree that year. The lover of cats. The person said this, I love the reaction of cat lovers when they see a cat. Every single time, the level of excitement is like they've read about cats for decades, but have never actually seen one in real life. And they're so excited every single time, even if it's the hundredth cat they've seen that day. Yeah, and some of you say, oh, a cat picture. Why are cat pictures such a big deal on the Internet? I don't know, but they are. But think about that. How do we react when we see a brother or sister in Christ? Like we've read about them for decades, but we've never actually seen one in real life. Yeah. No, we, we say, hi, good to see you again. We're, you know, shake hands one more time. Did it last week, we'll do it again this week. Some of you like to hug, and the hugs have been far and few between, uh, few and far between over these last months. Ah. But see, that's the kind of person that we need to be. The person who rejoices and says, you are our glory and our joy. Paul's expressive language is there. You know, because he sees this is what God is doing in the lives of his fellow saints. The brothers and sisters in Thessalonica. And underlying all this is the longing to be face to face and the legitimate concern that there might be something gone awry. Something has happened that not only has Satan blocked his coming to them, but also perhaps that the tempter, another name for Satan, has tempted them, which would make their work in vain. Paul has a great distance over time. He continues to have a deep desire to want to be with them because he has such joy and hope in them at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so that distance and desire and delight moves Paul to action, beginning in chapter 3 and verse 1. He says, therefore, and he goes back to we, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind in Athens alone. We sent Timothy. And again, in chapters 3, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, he talks about we. In verse 5, he repeats this. Did you notice that? For this reason, verse 5, when I could bear it no more, I sent to learn about your faith. There's a common concern that they had for the believers in Thessalonica, but that also was focused in the Apostle Paul. Paul says, we were ready to be left alone. We, we've, we've just recognized and expressed that we were torn away from you. Paul reunited with Silas and Timothy in Athens. He says, now I'm willing for your sake, to be alone again. It's better for me to be alone here to know that you're adequately cared for there. Again, what a model for us. He says, we didn't, we didn't consider it that big of a sacrifice to be left in Athens alone, and so we sent Timothy. Notice how he describes Timothy. Timothy. Our brother. That connection, that affirmation of Timothy, he's one of us. He's part of our circle. He's a trusted brother. And, and not only that, but he describes him as God's co-worker. You know, that's a pretty significant title. You know, Queen of England, significant title. President of the United States, pretty significant title. But dwarfing those two titles, uh -huh, God's co-worker. Wow. You know, 
Paul uses big titles like that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, ambassador for Christ. I like to keep that in my hip pocket when on airplanes, you know, what, what do you do? Well, I, I'm an ambassador. Yeah. <laughs> People don't talk to me on airplanes anyhow, so I've never gotten to use that. He's God's co-worker. He says this is his level of involvement and engagement. God is going to use Timothy as his special instrument in the lives of the people of Thessalonica. Paul has confidence in Timothy as his brother. Timothy with the title of God's co-worker that he sends him, he sends him to be with them to establish and to exhort in their faith. And he has a purpose for that at the end, so that no one be moved by these afflictions. What afflictions? The same afflictions that he's talked about in chapter 1, where he said, you receive the word of God with joy, great joy, in the midst of affliction. In chapter 2, they receive the word of God. In chapter 2, verse 2, Paul describes his own affliction. Chapter 2, verse 14, the same sufferings that Paul endured from his countrymen, so the Thessalonican church is experiencing that as well. These afflictions are real. These afflictions are troubling them. And these afflictions are what the tempter could use to pull them aside from the walk of faith. Now, ask you a question. Who's afflicted? Any, anybody in the room ever been afflicted? I think, come on, yeah. yeah. The rest of you are hiding something right now, okay? Uh, afflictions are real. Afflictions come. Sickness, opposition, difficulties, trials, all kinds of things come to us in life. Now, has, has anybody in the room here, since coming to Jesus Christ, have you experienced a pain-free, relief-from-all-suffering kind of life? Okay? No, I, I don't see a single hand. I don't. <laughs> Precious. Pr Precious is joking with us back there, okay? <laughs> no, it's just, we don't experience that. And Precious, it's lovely to see your face today, too. <laughs> it is. So I missed you in the earlier when I was pointing out people that have been away for a long time. It's great to be able to see one another. And none of us have that. And let me ask another question. Have any, has anyone experienced particular suffering and pain because you've embarked on the adventure of following Jesus Christ? Obedience to Christ is going to bring affliction. It's just real. Now, Robert's going to show us another picture here. Does God send afflictions? God doesn't send afflictions, this man says, and addictions to teach you. There are forces of darkness trying to keep us from our destiny. The good news is that what the enemy put on you, God wants to take off of you. No. No. God sends afflictions. Listen to the word of God. Romans 5, 3, we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance character and character hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts. James chapter 1 and verse 2, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. You know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And who's testing faith to produce steadfastness? Is that the devil putting that on us? No. That is God training us. Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, describes his own suffering to keep me from being conceited because of the surpassing greatness of these revelations. A thorn was given me in the flesh. And when the apostles use that passive voice there, a thorn was given, that is an indirect way of identifying God as the giver. He says, God sent a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, the Lord, 
My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul certainly experienced, as he says, I'm content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities, for when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Paul said in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 29, he says, Oh, we receive it with great joy. It has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should believe in him. And Paul says, not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. God has granted us that opportunity to suffer for the sake of Christ. The psalmist says in Psalm 119, verse 67, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Affliction is a great teacher. Verse 71, it's good for me that I was afflicted so that I might learn your statutes. This is what God does. Paul says, even when we came into Macedonia, 2 Corinthians 7, our bodies had no rest. We were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. Indeed, when Paul went to Thessalonica in the synagogues, in Acts chapter 17 and verse 3, he says that he was there explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and that Jesus is the Christ. Now, God afflicted his own son. God sent his own son through incredible, bitter, poisonous affliction and trial and death. Why would we think that we're exempt from that? God is with us in the midst of those trials. But it's, it's amazing. And Robert, you can look at, show the, the next picture up there now. Does God send afflictions? Here's someone else. Gradually, as I've studied the Bible and Christ Jesus' teachings in particular, I've come to see that God doesn't send sickness. Jesus, whose whole life was devoted to God, spent a good part of his ministry healing the sick. It doesn't make sense that disease would come through the will of this same God. So writes a practitioner of Christian science in 1997, denying the reality of physical sickness. And then someone else says, God doesn't send sickness to people to teach them something. He doesn't have any sickness and would have to steal it from the devil in order to give it to someone. Wow. That, now, that's, underneath that, there's a serious charge is that God is violating commandment number eight when he does that, stealing sickness from the devil to send it to someone. But notice how these two phrases, these two passages, picked at random from the interwebs, show us that there are people out there who are going to try to tell you God's not in this. God doesn't have a purpose in this. God doesn't have anything for you in this. And yet the word of God, as we've heard again and again, we suffer according to God's will, God's desire. As he, Peter writes in 1 Peter 4, 19. Wow. And in the midst of those afflictions, you have a need, I have a need, the church at Thessalonica has a need, which is for someone to come, Timothy, our brother, God's co-worker, to exhort you and to establish you in your faith or to strengthen you in your faith. What is it like when the affliction comes? When the tempter is tempting, he's not tempting you to produce steadfastness, he's tempting you to produce failure. And the temptation is there that you say, this is too much. I can't handle this. I don't know what to do with this. I'm struggling. I'm going to give in. I'm going to give up. It's at that precise moment that I need, that you need someone to be our brother and God's co-worker to exhort us to come alongside and be there with us, to strengthen us in our faith, that personal presence that's there in the midst of affliction. Times of affliction, we need one another. And while, again, it's helpful to get an email or a text message, it's helpful to have a phone call, 
but it's a horse of a completely different color to have a brother or a sister right there next to you exhorting you, strengthening you, being an agent of God's deliverance to bring strength and comfort and hope into your life when the tempter is raging against you. God sends affliction. Read Jonah. He got a whole bucket or two or three or four buckets of affliction from God. God will send those affliction moments to get our attention. And you can describe it as heat. You can describe it as pressure. Those of you who work in chemistry labs and maybe once in your life were in a chemistry lab, and you know what heat and pressure does to basic compounds. It's transformative. Heat and pressure in that way will bring things to the surface that were hidden below. And now that they're brought to the surface, then that gives God an opportunity to address those because now you're aware of them. You see them or others see them in your life. That's how God uses affliction to grow us, to change us, to shape us, to transform us. And what do we say? I know what I say. I can't blame you for this. I would prefer a nice, comfortable, air-conditioned, relaxing, soft life. Thank you very much. Can I have that, please? That, that's what my little Stevie Henderson heart of hearts would like to say most of the time. And, and I'm not alone in that. We like that. Isaac Watts wrote a hymn years ago when he was alive. Uh, Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? And shall I fear to own his cause or blush to speak his name? Affliction comes when you do that. The third verse of that hymn is this. Shall I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas? Hmm. You see? Can I just have that reasonable temperature? Temperature and pressure and time. You know? Yesterday, we had the delight of celebrating Saturday with a turkey. And when we pulled that turkey out of its wrapping, it was a dead bird. And we did some things to the dead bird. But then you know what we did to that poor dead bird? We put it in the oven and we turned up the heat. And the, last night at dinner, that turkey smelled marvelous. The skin was crisp and tasty. The meat was moist and juicy. It was good. But you know what? If you had offered me a slice of raw turkey at noon, no. It had to endure the heat and the time in the oven to be transformed into something glorious. And that's what's happening to you and me. The fire of affliction and refining comes. Trials come and we say, Lord, what do you have for me in this? What are you bringing to the surface? In your spare time, go to 1 Kings chapter 18. Verse 21 is your key verse. Elijah says to the king, How long will you waver? How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If Yahweh is God, worship him. If Baal is God, worship him. The heat of the moment, the oppression, the prophets of Baal are there. And the challenge comes in the moment of affliction. Who are you going to serve? You're going to have to serve somebody. That's the reality. How long will you waver between two opinions? What's going to push you to the point where you can say, I can be decisive about this. I choose to follow Christ. 
Christ. God does that in you and in me through affliction. He brings those choices to the surface. Now, I have a final question for you. Who cares for your soul? Who cares for your soul? See, do you have a Timothy? Usually when preachers ask, do you have a Timothy, they're saying, who are you discipling? (laughs) But notice how Paul kind of turned that around in this text. Timothy is the one who's coming to exhort and encourage and to strengthen and establish them in their faith. So who's your Timothy? Do you have someone who can come to you and bring encouragement, bring conviction, bring courage, strength, and establish you in your faith? Do you? Do you know who that person is? Do you know who you could call at 2 a.m. because you needed that kind of strengthening in the midst of your affliction? You need to have that person in mind. And you're ready for the flip of that, aren't you? Is there someone that you are in a relationship with where you are that kind of Timothy? Where you're speaking into someone's life, where you're bringing truth mixed with love to be God's catalyst for their growth and transformation to be more like Jesus? See, it goes both ways. I get the privilege of doing that with some of you. I can't do it with all of you. All of us as elders and small group leaders, we can't do that with all of you. We can do it with some of you. By God's grace, we have those opportunities to do that with more intensity from time to time, with regularity. But here on Sunday, I have the privilege of speaking God's truth to a crowd of people. And I want to charge you and encourage you and exhort you and strengthen you so that you can take up that mantle and you can be that kind of person in one another's lives. Because it's just not enough to have one person or four people who do it. But if 100 people, 150 people, 200 people pursue that kind of role in one another's lives, what a transformation that could make. But here's the sad reality. We don't like to do that. We don't like to speak that way to people because they might not receive it well. They they might, ah, you know, none of your business, go away. And that's true, they might do that. But you know what? That also reveals that often we're not open to others approaching us in that way sense of pride, I've got it together. Unbelief, I don't need this. Appearance management, dishonesty, it's all okay. When you know that just a few millimeters below the surface, there's a boiling cauldron of anxiety, of fear, of temptation that's about to hatch and bring forth death. It's at those times that we need each other. We desperately need one another. Now, I follow that up with the best news that I know. One day the afflictions will cease. One day Jesus Christ will return and establish a kingdom of righteousness. Evil will be punished. The saints will be gathered And in his presence forevermore, we'll enjoy what he has purchased for us on the cross. And in that moment, we will see him face to face. And we'll see one another as we really are face to face as well. We get to sing about that in just a minute. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing. And the Bubbles parents can go get their children at this time. Let's bow together. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the work that you've done. We thank you that you have put us together in this church, in this body, as brothers and sisters, to be joined together 
as living stones to be involved in one another's lives, to love one another deeply and purely from a pure heart. Lord, the task seems massive. It seems like it's impossible. And so we cry out to you for help. Lord, we are weak. We need you. We are shaking with unbelief. Renew our confidence in your promises. Give us hope that you are at work, will continue to be at work, and indeed you will complete the good work that you have begun in us by faith for the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen.